Okay. Yeah. I just got that. I, I heard it. It's recording. So, okay. And yes, we are recording. So, you know, bear in mind. Uh, and what I'll say too, is if either of you have questions that you'd rather ask off the recording, I can stay on a little after. So, you know, if you don't want to ask that on the recording for any reason, just stay on afterward and we can address those at that point. So, as I said, though, this is the fourth of a four part series. This has all been related to cognitive load, cognitive processing, how that impacts learning. Um, this content comes out of a book published by uh, Ruth Clark and Richard Mayer. Um, it's a book that I've had for many, many years now. Uh, I should have the title on hand, but I do not. It's e-learning and the science of instruction. Um, and within it, they talk about these learning principles that can be applied to a lot of e-learning, um, some of which might be done synchronously. So a lot of what we see here in OUWB, of course, is instructors presenting synchronously uh, to students, either live in person or via Zoom. But there are also opportunities to present information asynchronously through Moodle, H5P, the like, et cetera. So these principles can be applied across those spectrums. Um, and so over the past few months, we did sort of a broad introduction to the topic back in September. In October, we shifted our focus to strategies that minimize extraneous processing. Uh, in November, we talked about strategies to manage essential processing. We recorded both of those sessions as well. So if you wanted to go back and review those, you could. Um, and if you have any trouble finding the video, I can send you copies of them directly. Today, we're going to focus on strategies to foster generative processing. And so with that in mind, our topics today is we're going to do a brief review of some of what we talked about in the previous sessions. Ideally, that'll help you sort of remember what processes learners must engage in for effective learning to happen. You're probably going to hear me refer to these things several times today, but those processes, according to the models set forth by Clark and Mayer are that learners have to select the correct words in images that are shared in a lecture. If they don't select the correct material, uh, they're not going to build the, the appropriate sort of mental representations of information needed. Um, essentially, any sort of model that they build, mental model, is going to be incorrect. It's, it's based off the wrong information. Uh, so that's the first process is they have to select the correct words and images, then they have to organize those words and images into a coherent mental representation so it's an internal process. And once they start that process of building a mental representation of what's being presented, they have to take that mental representation and integrate it with uh, pre existing information already in long term memory. Um, so either creating brand new schemas or building upon schemas that already exist. Um, with, with new information that they're learning through your lectures. The second thing that we're gonna to do today then is do a deeper dive into generative processing specifically. Um, so we wanna get a sense of what generative processing is and how it impacts learning. Uh, and then the bulk of our session will be on this third topic, uh, strategies to foster generative processing. Um, there are three of them that we're gonna talk about today um, in the hopes that you'd be able to apply at least one of them to your teaching um, at some point in the future. So our first topic then, a review of key concepts. This graphic comes right out of the text by Clark and Mayer. Uh, it's a little overwhelming to look at perhaps the first time you've seen it. Robin, it's possible maybe that you've seen this. Deirdre, I don't know if, if this is sort of in, in your realm or not. Maybe you've seen this as well. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. Um, Sort of what we've got, and I guess, can you guys tell me, can you see my cursor floating around the screen right now? Yes. I'm going to use my cursor as a sort of a signaling device to kind of walk you through this a little bit. But everything that we're talking about today and everything that we've talked about in all of these sessions relates to sharing multimedia content with learners. And multimedia content is essentially any content that includes both words and pictures. And the thing to remember about words is they can pre be presented um, in a manner that can be perceived through the eye. So anything that appears written on the screen, such as what you see on my screen right now. And of course, words can also be perceived verbally. So what I'm saying to you right now is an example of that. Whereas pictures are only processed through the eyes. Um, so multimedia content, words and pictures that are shared with learners. Okay. 
Um, let's talk about stages of memory first. So as, as we present information to learners, it first enters into sensory memory and it's competing with every other stimulus you could possibly imagine. Um, things that students are consciously paying attention to and things that students are subconsciously unaware of, um, even though they are happening. So that's the relevant information, the stuff that you're sharing with them that you hope that they're retaining, but that's also the ambient temperature in the room, the conversation their neighbor is having, um, how hungry they are, what their plans are this weekend. All of those things can be happening in um, sensory memory. Okay, so it's it's sort of ubiquitous. It's constantly perceiving things in the world around us. Um, and we want to, to the extent possible, um, sort of monopolize sensory memory while students are in our classroom. But as you both know, I'm sure that doesn't always happen. Um, and the ways in which students perceive new information with regards to a multimedia content presentation is through their ears and through their eyes. Of course, you can perceive stimuli through other means, um, but that doesn't come into play in the classroom as frequently. You know, we have olfactory senses. Uh, we have the ability to, we have tactile senses. So, yeah, and, and we have taste, of course, uh, but we're not doing those things as frequently in a multimedia setting. Um, so primarily this, this model relates to, again, things that we're perceiving through the ears and the eyes. Um, once we get past sensory memory, we get into working memory. Um, it's very limited. We'll come back to this a little bit as we talk about some of these principles and processes. Um, the goal is to get information into long-term memory because once information is in long-term memory, short of some physical trauma or um, sometimes through the process of aging, there can be impacts on long-term memory. But by and large, once information is in long-term memory, uh, learners are able to recall that information at a later date as needed, okay? Of course, there can be circumstances where uh, life affects that, amnesia, trauma, et cetera. But by and large, we wanna get information into long-term memory because once it's there, learners can retain it and bring it back as needed. So. When we get into the principles of learning, which is sort of the root of all of what we've been talking about these past four months, those include dual channels, limited capacity, and active processing. Dual channels is really this idea that in a multimedia presentation, students are uh, processing information again through the ears and the eye, so dual channels. Limited capacity is really related to working memory and our ability to select information again we want students to select the correct information. Um, and so some of the strategies that we talked about back in, if I, if I go back really quickly, what we had talked about in sort of October was this idea of removing content from your presentations that might take away from the ability for students to select the correct information. So if you're including information that flat out doesn't relate or relates and it's interesting, but maybe doesn't support the main objectives of a lesson, you may have circumstances where students are paying attention to information that you that doesn't really support the main objective of the lesson. And so, of course, we want to try and remove some of that extraneous content when possible. And essential processing was more this idea of if your content in and of itself is so complex that it sort of expands beyond the zone of proximal development that exists for your students, it doesn't even matter if you don't have extraneous content in your presentation. If the content itself is so dense that students can't possibly conceptualize it in one setting, we talked about strategies on how to sort of overcome that. Um, today, we're really more so focused on strategies that relate to organizing words and images and integrating those mental representations that students are making. Um, and those are the strategies that relate more to active processing and uh, generative processing, which is what we're gonna get into more today. So I don't wanna spend much more time on this image uh, because we have a lot more to get into today. But before I proceed, do you have any questions? Nope, none of mine. Okay, <clears throat> very good. Gives me a chance to get a glass of water too. All right, so 
we've, we've already touched on this a little bit. I don't need to spend very much time on this. We have extraneous processing, essential processing, and generative processing. Um, those are sort of things, those are demands on cognitive improv cognitive processing that can impact how well learning happens. Again, today we're going to be talking more about generative processing. We've already previously spoken about extraneous and essential processing. Um, and so the principles that were covered last month were related to managing essential processing. So that included the segmenting principle, the pre-training principle, and the modality principle. By utilizing those principles, again, you can help students attune to the most essential information in a presentation. That is the information that supports the main objectives of the lesson. So before we get into sort of the deeper dive on generative processing, the things that you might want to retain for the remainder of today's presentation moving forward is that learners must engage in the following processes for significant learning to occur. So they have to select the correct words and images. They have to organize those words and images into a coherent mental representation. And once they've done those two things uh, successfully, they need to be able to integrate that new information into pre-existing information already in long-term memory. And as educators then, we wanna guide learners through those processes by minimizing extraneous processing, managing essential processing, and fostering generative processing. And again, the remainder of today's presentation is gonna be on this last part here. So let's get into generative processing. To start, what is generative processing? Um, it's cognitive processing aimed at a deeper understanding of the core material. Um, it consists, as I said, mainly of organizing and integrating the new, uh, the relevant material um, with pre-existing information. It's really a byproduct of learner motivation. We know and many studies have shown that when learners have sufficient motiv motivation to persist through those phases of organization, uh, well, selection and organization, and they can get to that stage of integration, um, that is when significant learning can occur. Okay, if learners don't have that motivation, um, they may or may not select the correct information. And even if they do that, you know, even if they've paid attention long enough to select some information, they may not persist through that organization piece that that creating that mental representation. Um, and certainly, if they don't do either of those things, they're not going to be able to integrate any new information with what already exists. It's an issue when, again, motivation is lacking. So when learners don't engage in sufficient generative processing. Um, they're really not getting the, these new bits of information that we want them to get into long-term memory. So how do we address insufficient generative processing? You wanna use strategies that promote psychological engagement. Um, and a little bit later in the presentation, we're gonna talk about sort of the difference between psychological engagement and behavioral or physical engagement. Um, but these strategies are particularly aimed at addressing psychological engagement. We want students to be active processors, active participants in the learning strategy, in the learning process. Uh, if students are just sitting passively, not really engaged, um, again, learning is not likely to happen. And to be clear, learners can be behaviorally passive. They can just be sitting, not doing much physically, and still be doing a great deal of cognitive processing. Um, and, and that can be difficult to, to tell. It's an internal process. We have to sort of infer that it's happening. Um, but they can still learn a great deal, even if they're physically inactive. Uh, so the principles that we're going to talk today about are include the personalization principle, the multimedia principle, and the engagement principle. Um, and there's a sort of, sort of a brief synopsis of each of those things there, uh, but we'll get more into each of them momentarily. So key points related to generative processing uh, before we get into the strategies themselves. One, when learners don't engage in sufficient generative processing, the key concepts will not be effectively organized or integrated. So again, they have to have already selected the correct words and the correct images from your session. Uh, and once they've done that, 
then they can begin that process of organization and integration. Uh, but they're going to need to be motivated to do those things. And so as instructors, we want to help sort of build that motivation for learners and utilize these strategies that are aimed at supporting learner motivation so that they persist through all three of those learner processes that they have to persist through according to the multimedia principle, uh, sorry, the multimedia model that Clark and Mayer have put forth for us. So before we proceed into these strategies, um, just as I get to each of the end of these segments, I like to pause briefly and ask, are there any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Um, so I'll give you both a moment to come to the mic if you have any. I'm good. No, nope, not on my end. Very good. Very good. Um, <clears throat> if you're comfortable, you're welcome to put stuff in the chat. Um, I can, I have that pulled up. Um, and certainly if as I'm going through, we're a small group, you want to chime in, feel free to do that as well. So again, the strategies that we're going to talk about today include the personalization principle, the multimedia principle, and the engagement principle. What we're going to look at is sort of how you can apply these in the classroom, what evidence exists to, uh, to show that these are actually useful and our best practice. Um, so let's jump into it starting with the personalization principle. And the synopsis here, basically, the, the sort of the big piece of this is that you want to use a conversational style when speaking with your learners. Uh, you want to use polite wording. Um, and you want to use a human voice when presenting material. And really, these last two, polite wording and human voice, um, that's more aimed at the asynchronous content that you might be creating. Um, naturally, you're going to use a human voice when you're speaking to students in person, of course. It, it's you speaking. Um, you know, and I don't see this a lot in OUWB, but there are certain uh, agencies, institutions, possibly instructors in other units at OU or otherwise that are creating asynchronous content um, where they're having some sort of robot voice read the text. And, and it's better than nothing, but ideally we actually wanna narrate our content ourselves versus having a robot read it for us. So let's get into this a little bit. Um, starting with some of the psychological reasons you wanna use this principle um, related to social cues. So according to cognitive theories of multimedia communication, a lot of this comes out of the work by Dr. Richard Mayer. Um, he has studies from 2009, 2014 that touch on this point specifically. Um, the presence of social cues acti activate a sense of social presence in learners. That's essentially a feeling of being in a conversation with the presenter or the author, rather than being a sort of a passive participant in something that's happening around them. Um, when you build those, those feelings of being present, um, that causes the learner to engage in deeper cognitive processing during learning. Essentially, the learners start working harder to understand what is being said. You're building some of that motivation because they see themselves as being an active participant rather than a passive one. As a byproduct, by working harder, students experience better learning outcomes. Put another way then, social cues prime learners for deeper learning. When social cues are absent, students are less likely to engage in that deep learning process and when that's the case, they're less likely to effectively organize or integrate the information into long-term uh, into long-term memory. Um, so when your instructional message includes social cues, you know, hi, welcome, glad you're here, you know, how are you doing today? Things like that. Um, again, it's it's priming learners for deeper learning. Um, it may sometimes, I, I, I assume in front of a, a big lecture. I, I, I see a lot of our faculty do this anyway, and it may come across as just a simple thing, easy to overlook even. Um, but evidence shows that those social cues actually have significant value because they are priming learners for the experience that's about to happen. So if you're doing those things, kudos. And if you're not, try and find a way to, uh, to start doing some of those things, okay? So what are some ways that we can apply the personalization principle? Well, the first one is you want to use a conversational style um, specifically as opposed to a formal style. Um, 
The general rationale for putting words in formal style is that a conversational style can detract from the seriousness of the message. Um, I, again, the goal of a lesson is to convey information, not build a relationship, right? Well, actually not. That, such an argument is rooted in a view that in, the instructor's job is to present information and that the learner's job is to acquire information. So sort of that passive role again. Um, and we know from learning theories, sort of the evolution of learning theories over the last hundred years or so, that we don't want learners to be passive. We actually want learners to be active participants in the learning process. And so while it may seem like common sense that, you know, I'm presenting something serious and therefore I need to speak about it in a serious way, that's actually incongruent with how learning happens in the human mind. So according to cognitive learning theories, humans strive to make sense of presented materials by applying appropriate internal cognitive processes. Um, correspondingly, instructional materials should not only present information, but again, we want to prime learners for the learning that's about to happen. Uh, and so by doing some of that priming, again, we're, we're getting learners prepared to engage in some of those internal processes that we want them to engage in so that come the end of the lesson, they're more likely to retain the information that we need them to retain. Um, research on discourse processing shows that people work harder to understand material when they feel that they're in a conversation with partners rather than simply receiving information. Um, and that is sort of buttressed by uh, research from Beck, Macau, and Sandoro, Kukan, and Worthy uh, from 1996, on top of mountains of research that Dr. Mayer has done on this himself. The next thing is you want to use polite wording versus direct wording. Now, it's important to note that this is really related to <clears throat> on-screen agents or coaches or guides that might exist in asynchronous learning. Now, thus far, I haven't seen a lot of this at OUWB, and that's fine. Because they're, you know, if you're building asynchronous content, the next thing that we'll talk about has more to do with applying the personalization principle. But briefly on this idea of using polite wording versus direct wording, um, according to research by Brown and Levinson, uh, their politeness theory, alternative wordings that are polite versus direct allow learners to save face um, really by giving the learner some freedom of action, um, this ability to work collaboratively with an on-screen agent or guide rather than working for them. Um, uh, an additional study by Wang, Johnson, Mayer, Rizzo, Shaw, and Collins found that learners do engage in deeper learning when interacting with polite on-screen agents or guides. Um, and this is particularly true for uh, less experienced learners. Um, a, a simple example of this is, you know, you could have on a screen, you know, click enter to proceed. Um, an alternative, more polite way to put that might be you may want to click enter. And again, it's this idea of partnership. It's this idea of agency. Um, you're sort of providing guidance as opposed to direction. Um, I think it might be easy to blur those two lines, but there is actually substantial evidence to support that learning is improved when, when you do these things. And finally, there's this idea of using a human voice versus a digital voice. Uh, and welcome, Jim. Good afternoon. Um, and put simply, this is really that people learn better from narration presented in a human voice versus a machine voice. Um, so when you're recording material for your students, whenever possible, use your own voice and not something that is reading text for you. Again, I don't see that too often in OUWB, um, at least not in the content that I've been able to look at. So what evidence exists to support the personalization principle? Uh, one such study is one done by Moreno and Mayer um, related to this idea of better learning from personalized narration. So what they did is in a set of five experimental studies involving computer based uh, a computer-based educational game on botany, Moreno and Mayer compared versions in which the words were presented using a formal style with versions that were presented using a more conversational style. Um, so you can see the, the two versions on the screen. The more formal version is up top 
the personal version is below. Um, in five out of five studies, students who learned with the personalized text on the bottom performed better on a subsequent transfer test than students who learned from the formal text. Overall, participants in the personalized group produced between 20 and 46% more solutions on uh, transfer test problems than the formal group. Um, each of those five studies had an effect size greater than one. Um, in the example on the screen, one study showed an improvement of 46%. The effect size for that particular study is 1.55, which is considerably large. Um, and if you read both the formal version and the personalized version, you'll know that they say basically the same thing. So it's not so much what you say, but how you say it. Um, so again, evidence exists, at least across these five studies, that if you're presenting information in a more personal manner to students, um, they are more likely to be successful on transfer tests versus if you presented the same information or essentially the same information in a more formal tone. So going back to what we had said earlier, you know, there might be this intuition that I'm presenting on a serious subject. I need to present this in a formal manner. Um, the evidence would show, and, and again, this is related to how humans process, we're social beings, uh, when we prime learners for learning, using those social cues and speaking to them in a personalized manner versus a more formalized manner, you're actually gonna see better learning from that. Any questions on that? So that's just one example. Um, and you might think to yourself, oh, you know, maybe that's not enough to go on. Um, Collector Mayor present quite a few more research studies that indicate that the personalization the personalization principle is indeed worthwhile, is indeed worth um utilizing in, in your lectures and in your classes. Um, and so here is just a smattering of some of the uh studies that they've you know spoken on um and found that um, serve as evidence for this principle. Um, and some of the subcategories of the personalization principles, that idea of, again, personalization versus, you know, using that conversational style, uh, using polite speech, and then voice, quali uh, voice quality. So that idea of using a human voice versus uh, a digital voice or a robot voice. Moving on then, uh, the multimedia principle. And this is a pretty straightforward one. And in their text, this is actually uh, the first chapter that they present related to they have sort of three chapters that are more introductory um you know getting into the the weeds on some of the the prince uh the model overall uh, but chapters four through 12 or 13 go over all these principles and the multimedia principle is actually the first one that they touch on um and it's rather simple it's this idea that when you're presenting information to students, you wanna use words and graphics rather than words alone. And remember, everything that we're talking about pertains to multimedia presentations, but that is by and large, the manner in which uh, information is being con conveyed to students in OUWB, uh, particularly as we talk about like didactic lectures, those large lecture hall lectures, et cetera. So what's the premise here? Um, again, learners have dual channels for processing information. Um, to effectively utilize both of those channels, you want to present multimedia presentations using words and graphics. Based on cognitive learning theory and research evidence, presentations should include both words. Uh, and remember, words includes both printed text, so things you see on screen, and spoken words. The example being what I'm saying to you right now. Um, they also include graphics wherever possible. We want to see those things presented simultaneously to learners. And the rationale for this is pretty straightforward. Um, people are more likely to understand material presented when they engage in active learning, that is when they engage in those relevant cognitive processes that we've been discussing, um, and they are more effectively able to do those things, to, to select the correct words and information, to organize that information, and to integrate that information when they're processing it through both channels simultaneously versus just one. Um, 
if you're only presenting information as words or if you're only presenting information as graphics, uh, you actually run the risk of more easily overrunning one of those two channels and therefore overloading cognitive processing. Whereas if I'm presenting information pictorially and auditorially, um, learners can more effectively engage in both, both of those processes in parallel. So multimedia presentations, again, can encourage learners to engage in active processing by presenting the material as the words and pictures that allows learners to more easily make those mental connections between the information presented as learners more effectively process information through two channels rather than one. So I said it was rather straightforward. I think I gave a rather roundabout answer to it. Does that generally make sense? I'll take the silence as uh, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, it makes sense to me. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it makes sense. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so this idea again, make sure that we're presenting information as both graphics and words. Easy enough, right? Well, pulled off a little bit because not all graphics are equally valuable. Um, and this was this was fascinating to me the first time I read it. I, I recently sort of re-looked at some of this and... Um, it's easy to take for granted that, you know, graphics are graphics, you know, they're all essentially the same. Well, I think this chart sort of shows that, no, there are different types of graphics, um, some of which are far more valuable than others. Uh, so if we start sort of from the top, decorative graphics are those things that are just visuals that are added for aesthetic appeal. Um, so there's an example there of, you know, just a person riding a bicycle, a lesson about how bicycle pump works. It's not unrelated necessarily, but it doesn't do anything to move learners toward the goal of the lesson, which is to understand how a bicycle pump works. Um, and actually, in certain circumstances, there has been evidence shown that decorative images can actually have an adverse effect on learning. Um, again, if you have learners that are investing that limited cognitive processing capacity that they have looking at an image and not paying attention to how a bicycle pump works, that image may actually hurt learning in certain circumstances. That seems like a pretty innocuous example, but it's not hard to kind of think about, oh, you know, maybe certain things that I'm presenting aren't actually adding anything to the lesson. And if you find yourself looking at materials that you've created and going, uh oh, I have images here that don't really pertain to what I'm talking about. There's evidence to show that you should probably consider removing such images. Okay. Next, we have representation. Yeah, Robin, I see you've got a hand raised. What what can I answer for you? I see there's something in the chat too. Robin, did you have something to add? If, if so, maybe you're muted. I'm so sorry. Yes. No, you're good. I apologize. <laughs> so what I've seen with the images, um, the some of the issues that we run into, right, is the, the clarity of the image, the quality, the quality of the image. And so we, mm -hmm. have, we have a few things to be careful. I know this is being recorded. So for it's not for the folks that are here necessarily, but for others who may be listening, a um, couple of things with images that have come up over time, right? So making sure HIPAA is adhered to and we don't have patient information being displayed. Simply putting the black box over the image in that format is movable by students, right? They So we have to be careful with images that are used. They need to be of a quality um, two, that is like, yes, instructionally sound, um, informative, doing a show, don't tell. Often they should be about what the right action to do is and not the wrong, because they will kind of resonate in learners' minds um, longer when you're showing them. Um, so if you do have to do a don't image, you know, make sure clearly it's displayed as a don't with the red X through it or a red line, you know, and it's shown first and not last. It's just a um, a guide. And then um, in terms of the where you're sourcing your image, make sure you're sourcing it correctly and citing it. And don't just, you know, we do have a lot 
of, of instructors, unfortunately, will just go to Google and snag an image and stick it in there. And it's, it's not, it's a copyright violation, right? So we have to be really careful about um, images. So I just wanted to share that. So thank you. Yeah, no, good information. And it's, it's always a reminder that, you know, instructors have so much to think about when, when they're building their content, you know, here I am talking about one thing and, and obviously Robin, that's really good insight. Um, but that's another thing for instructors to take into consideration. Um, I very much empathize with the work that instructors have to do to create these, these quality presentations that, that we're asking them to create for students. Absolutely. Um, and we have, um, we do have Lauren Chapsky, who is a graphic artist on staff here who can help um, as a, and, you know, an additional resource. I do often engage her on things as well, because yeah, to develop and design a good graphic is really hard. It's not something we'd, you know, instructors necessarily have time to do. So I would look to that as well. Thanks. No, thank you. Yeah. I've looked at Lauren also. I think she's very uh, valuable addition to OUWB. Um, Moving down the list, then we have other graphic types. Um, Robin sort of touched on a, a, an example of a representational type of graphic. So if you're taking a screenshot, uh, say you were taking an example from Epic um, of a patient profile, certainly if you're doing something like that, yes, you want to make sure that you're blocking out any uh, personally identifiable information. Um, you know, we don't want to violate HIPAA law, even if we're trying to uh, teach, educate future doctors. Um, and we want to adhere by the law. Um, but those representational graphics, they portray a singular element. Um, that might be a photo of, a, if we keep with the example, a bicycle tire pump uh, with the caption, bicycle tire pump. Uh, and that isn't bad. Um, it's perhaps more uh, of a prudent uh, image to share than someone riding a bicycle. You know, at least you can point to them and say, hey, you know, if you don't know, this is what a bicycle pump looks like. But it does, it's not really still adding very much to a uh, to a presentation. Um, the next two are sort of related, organizational and relational. Um, they are visuals that show relationships um, either among qualitative content or quantitative content. Um, so a table um, or a matrix can be something that shows sort of a qualitative relationship. So the table that you're seeing on the screen right now, this is an organizational graphic type uh, versus a quantitative relationship um, might be a graph or a pie chart. Uh, we've seen some examples of those uh, previously in this session. We'll see a few more later in some of the evidence sections. Transformational, um, there's actually one of those that I'll be showing momentarily, but a good example of a transformational uh, graphic type are, and you're probably all relatively familiar with these because they were a big deal about a month ago, is those um, voter charts or those voter images that they show on CNN or NBC or Fox or wherever. Um, you know, this state voted this way in the 2016 election versus now in the 2020 election, they are voted this way. So those are sort of transformational graphics. They illustrate those changes over time or over space. Uh, and then there are interpretive graphics uh, that allow visuals to show some invisible phenomenon. Okay. Some general recommendations related to graphics. Um, you want to minimize decorative graphics as they don't really do anything to foster generative processing. As I said, in certain instances, they can actually detract from learning. Uh, representational graphics are fine depending on your goal um, when presenting an image, but they're typically less valuable than graphics presented at the lower part of the table. You want to aim to, again, so the multimedia principle, which you're talking about, says we want to include words and graphics together. So when we're including graphics, you want to include graphics that help learners organize material, such as those organizational or relational graphics, or graphics that help learners understand the material, such as transformational or interpretive graphics. Um, and graphics presented with words can help students better understand the presented information uh, particularly when you pair an appropriate graphic with the um, the corresponding words on screen. Okay. So what are some different ways that we can use graphics? You can use them as a topic organizer. So this is simply a screenshot from the eSpace that I have created for all of um, 
all the OUWB faculty. If you've seen this, that you may recognize what, what you see on the screen there, but you can use graphics as topic organizers. That might be something you do on a Moodle page, for example, where we can use a graphic to sort of um, visually depict where one set of information begins and the next one ends, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Another way is to show relationships. So just as I was talking about, um, you can you can show relationships over time or space. Um, you can color code things um, to show how things change. And you can even use it as a lesson interface. So used for guided discovery, um, essentially a graphical interface that's used as a backdrop to present things like case studies. Um, so you might envision perhaps a virtual clinic where learners can click on different patients um, to try and determine who should get priority um, to be seen next. And just for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of continue on here. What evidence do we have um, that supports the multimedia principle? Um, Mayer in 2009 did a study where he presented information to learners about how a bicycle pump works. Uh, and he did two versions of this presentation. He did one that was a words alone presentation. So students simply got the text on the left um, to sort of conceptualize. So they had to do all the internal conceptualization themselves. They had to organize those words into their own mental representation. Go ahead, read the text without looking at the image if you can. Can you effectively conceptualize what that would look like. Conversely, he had another group of students who, had, who were read or who saw the exact same text. So if you read the text on the left and you read the text on the right, it's exactly the same. What's happening though is the text on the right is paired with an image. Uh, it also, uh, it, uh, uh, is in line with the um, contiguity principle, specifically the spatial contiguity principle, in that the text is sort of broken up in that, you know, the rod, so this bit of the text is pointing specifically at the rod, and down here below, we have the corresponding text put closer to the portion of the image that it's related to. So not only are the words being presented with a graphic, uh, they're also adhering to the spatial contiguity principle, uh, which is more related to managing essential processing. But, you know, students got the double benefit here of getting the graphic, but also having the words sort of broken up so that they are more closely in line with what area of the image they're related to. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and what Mayer found was those students who viewed the words alone version of the presentation did more, uh, did poorer not as well as their contemporaries who did uh, who viewed the lesson with words and graphics. Their percent correct on the transfer test uh, was much lower than the ones who got the words and graphics. Um, and this was true across actually 11 different study groups. Um, so again, one set of the students got a multimedia lesson with words and graphics, and they performed better on the subsequent transfer test than the students who received the same information presented as words alone. Uh, across those 11 studies, students who learned from the multimedia presentation pre produced between 55 and 121% more correct solutions uh, to transfer problems than the students who learned from the words alone presentation. Across all studies, there was an 89% median gain um, with an effect size greater than one. Um, and the chart that's on the screen right now shows results from one of the 11 studies performed um, but again, he did this, Mayer did this particular study 11 times over and found out of all 11 of those, always, always, always the students who got the words plus graphics did better than the students who got the words alone presentation. So that brings us to our last principle. I do realize we only have 10 minutes uh, left in the formal presentation. Um, if you do need to step out, at three o'clock or before, I certainly understand. Again, the session's being uh, recorded. Um, if we do go over a little bit, I can certainly stay on and address questions. Um, but if you do need to leave, no worries. I, I, I get that time is precious. So our last principle then is the engagement principle. And this is basically that you wanna present words as audio narration rather than as on-screen text. Uh, that doesn't mean you need to get rid of all on-screen text, but by and large, um, 
where possible, uh, you want to present information, the, the, the words portion of your presentation in, in a spoken manner versus an on-text manner. And that's particularly true when you are utilizing something like the multimedia principle where we want to present words and pictures together as part of a, a presentation, okay? And again, that gets back to this idea of we have two channels to process information. Um, and if you're presenting too many words on screen with images, you're more likely to overload the visual cortex without taking much advantage of uh, the auditory cortex. Uh, so if you can balance that out a little better, uh, your students are going to have greater learn, learning outcomes because of that. Okay, so two key points to know here related to the engagement principle. We touched on this earlier in the presentation, but there are two different kinds of engagement. There's psychological engagement that does lead to learning, uh, and there's behavioral engagement, um, which doesn't always lead to uh, learning because behavioral engagement can involve doing things that are physically active, but aren't actually working students toward the learning objectives of the lesson. Uh, also, effective behavioral engagement, which fosters psychological engagement, is going to typically require instructional support or guidance, um, something to help learners get to the outcomes we want them to achieve. So these things exist in parallel, they overlap with one another a little bit because you can have instances where um, <clears throat> learners engage in neither. They're sort of in couch potato mode where they're not doing anything. Um, they can engage in just behavioral engagement or they can engage in just psychological engagement. Uh, and in certain instances, they can both be both psychologically and behaviorally engaged. Um, behavioral engagement basically involves any overt physical action during learning. Um, that can include creating written oral summaries of a lesson, um, oral explanations of portions of a lesson, etc. cetera. Um, psychological engagement is mental activity. It's an internal process um, that's aimed at promoting achievement of learning objectives. It, it includes things like attending to the relevant material, organizing it, into that mental coherent structure um, and integrating it with prior knowledge. It's, it's those, those learner processes that we need learners to engage in for meaningful learning to actually occur. That is what we need students to do. We need them to be psychologically engaged for learning to happen. If they're not, learning is not gonna happen. That can occur with or without behavioral engagement. This is what that looks like on sort of a matrix type scale. So you can envision circumstances uh, where learners have low behavioral activity and low psychological activity. That's that quadrant two down on the bottom left. Uh, and again, Clark and Mayer refer to that as couch potato mode. Um, and that involves minim minimal physical or psychological activity. It typically does not lead to conscious learning. Um, it can, however, be beneficial in certain circumstances. And an example that they gave of that is meditation. Meditation is an activity that by and large involves very little behavioral activity. You're typically sitting still or very still, uh, and you're typically trying to clear your mind. You're typically trying purposely not to think about too many things. Um, and again, that can be valuable um, at times, um, but if you have a particular learning objective in mind, that's not something that's gonna help with that. Okay, <clears throat> if we move to the right, quadrant one, um, those are activities that are high in behavioral engagement, but low in relevant psychological activities. Um, in that case, learners are physically doing something, but they're not mentally engaged with the core material. And in that circumstance, learning isn't very likely to occur, uh, not in a multimedia presentation anyway. Um, there are other disciplines where actually that may lead to learning, but by and large for the purposes of OUWB, and the content that we have students that are engaged in, um, that's not really the quadrant we're looking for. And in fact, there's evidence to show that in some cases, behavioral activity can have an adverse effect on learning. Uh, again, it's this idea of students are doing something and that whatever it is that they're doing is actually distracting and detracting from the psychological engagement that they otherwise are not, or maybe even are engaged in, um, but the physical activity is sort of overwhelming the psychological processing that's supposed to be happening. 
So really what we're looking for is for students to be in one of the top two quadrants, three or four. Okay, so um, quadrant three, the top left is mental activity that is paired with a behavioral activity, uh, or, or I'm sorry, mental activity that's not paired with some sort of behavioral activity. So something like reading for meaning is an example of that. Uh, students are physically not really doing anything. They're just sitting, reading, but they're very intentionally being cognitively active during that time. They've been given some sort of prompt to encourage them to be very uh, highly psychologically engaged. And finally, quadrant four, um, this idea of being both behaviorally and mentally highly active. Um, so completing a practice problem, such as work that students might do at the Clinical Skills Center, um, that's an experience where they both actively and psychologically engaged. Um, and that can promote achievement of learning objectives um, related to those types of activities. And those can be very valuable, again, mostly because they're engaged in a high level of psychological activity. Um, we talked about this idea that behavioral activities can sometimes impede learning. And here's one such example. Uh, Stolen Mayer in 2007 did a, uh, a um, an experiment with three student groups. Um, so group one uh, was asked to complete their own graphic organizer while reading. So basically an outline, think of an outline. Uh, so they had these students read a chapter and they asked those students in group one to complete their own outline to sort of make sense of what it was that they were reading about. Group two conversely read the same chapter, um, but those students were given a corresponding uh, outline or graphic organizer that was developed by the instructor. And finally, you had group three, uh, which was told to read the chapter, was not told to create a graphic organizer, nor were they provided one by the instructor. So what was happening here effectively was that those group one students um, were both behaviorally and psychologically engaged. They were reading, we were reading for meaning, but they were also tasked with creating an outline. So that was a behavioral activity. They had to physically write out an outline. Um, and what ended up happening, and I apologize, I don't know where the slide went. I had a slide that showed the examples, uh, the, the findings here, but basically what happened was those students in group two had the highest uh, percent correctness on a transfer test um, because they were able to uh, put most of their effort into that psychological engagement, um, but they also got the benefit of the graphic organizer that had been provided by the instructor. Um, and then group two, uh, group three um, in turn also had higher uh, results than group one. And th the takeaway here was basically that because students were engaging in these behavioral processes that that act of physically writing out an outline that actually had an adverse effect on their learning you know they were still being highly psychologically engaged but some of that was going toward or some of the mental effort was going toward the physical activity of writing out the outline <clears throat> and again i know we're basically at time we have here a presentation of eight generative learning strategies from Fiorella and Mayer. Uh, this actually comes out of a book that they wrote, Learning as a Generative Activity. And I apologize, I just realized I did not share a copy of today's presentation in the chat. I'm going to do that right now. So you all in a moment will have a copy of today's, a PDF copy of today's presentation in the, the Zoom chat. You're welcome to download that. Uh, on this particular slide, I've linked the book that this comes from, Learning as a Generative Activity. Uh, so if you're interested in, in learning more about these generative learning strategies, um, this book exists, Learning as a Generative Activity. I would imagine it's on the OU Library website, so you're welcome to download it. Uh, but those are some of the things there. Other means of engagement that can lead to generative processing include, you know, providing relevant graphics, have students participate in something called supported drawing. So you might ask them to draw something, but then you start to give verbal feedback as they're going through that process. Um, they can collaboratively observe uh, tutoring 
Um, so there's research out there that show I, tutoring is, as you might imagine, uh, sort of an ideal learning environment. You're getting one-on-one -on -one attention, but it's not very scalable and it's quite expensive. Uh, there's actually evidence to show that, uh, particularly among university students, um, observing others being tutoring is quite valuable as well. It's not quite to the same level as uh, individual tutoring, but it's better than um, alternatives where the student doesn't receive any tutoring um, or, and is sort of asked to do all the work on their own. Uh, so collaborative tutoring can be something. Peer teaching, um, obviously we do some of this with the self-directed learning. Um, you know, We want students to try and learn things and, and teach them to their peers. Uh, so those are some alternative ways that you can get students engaged um, to foster some of that generative processing that we're looking for. So I do realize that we are a minute over formal time, but these are the references for today's presentation. Um, these are all permalinks to the OU library version of the text, e-learning and the science of instruction. So if you wanna read more about any of the principles that we talked about today or any of the other principles that have been covered earlier this semester related to extraneous or essential processing, um, all of that is available on the OU library for you for free um, with your OU credentials. So I am more than happy to stay on. Otherwise, I do appreciate all of you attending today. I do know Deirdre had to step out. Um, and if you have any questions, I can stay on for a little while. Thank you, Cody. Jim, you're very welcome. I appreciate you coming. Robin, did you have any questions? I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.